Greetings, comrades, and welcome to our episode about Poland and Lithuania, and about why Soviets actually lost this war to so many of our little countries, you know, all the Baltics, Finland, Poland, and all these other places. It's a bit late again, but we had to rewrite huge parts of the script, especially when it concerns Poland and Lithuania itself, because of the because of the fact that some sources just proved to be flat out inaccurate, sometimes sometimes even lying and not very truthful indeed. Because uh, as you'll see later on in the episode, there are still many controversial topics concerning Poland and Lithuania during this uh, th- during this period, and also I have decided to you know give a whole episode to Mr. Mr. Pilsudski. But his episode better feels in when we'll talk about the interwar period. In either way, we shall see the beginning of massive Soviet atrocities, war crimes and evil things done by the Soviets, and how Lithuania and Poland became a thing, and we will also learn about their internal disputes. I hope you'll enjoy this episode, it's a bit more chaotic than the previous one, but it's all due to the chaoticness of this period. We try to make some sense and go back to timeline at the end, and to explain all the important things in detail and in such a way that you could orient yourselves around this. Let's talk about Lithuania first and everything that happened after after the third partition of Poland. See, administratively, Lithuania was divided into the area directly acquired by Russia in 1795, and the area acquired from Prussia after the Napoleon- Napoleonic Wars in 1815. The latter part was nominally <clears throat> autonom- autonomous kingdom of Poland and lived under the Napoleonic Code, uh, whereas the earlier was directly ruled by the Russian Empire. And 1815 is very important because uh, this is when the Congress of Vienna happened. And at this Congress, the, Euro- the great European powers divided up the continent. Poland itself was divided between Prussia, Russia, and Austria. And yeah, Prussia took the western and northern part of Poland, while Russia took the center and east. Austria just kept Galicia. And yeah, Poland and Lithuania, by this partitioning, uh, was considered a single country. So, this will come important later. The great powers were not willing to restore Polish independence. Instead, they created a semi-independent Poland. Again, the Russian part of Poland was made into this Kingdom of Poland, which also included Lithuania. And yeah, I have to warn you, this text has been uh, put together from both Lithuanian and Polish sources, so obviously Lithuanians consider the fact that part of them was in this Kingdom of Poland as a, a bit of a pickle and a sticking point in their history. So yeah, in this Kingdom of Poland, Tsar was the official monarch, but his powers was li- were limited, and the kingdom had its own government and army. The Poles were very dissatisfied about all this situation, and in 1830, the rebellion broke out. Uh, some Polish uh, soldiers attempted to assassinate the Tsar's brother, and the Polish parliament declared the Tsar deposed. However, the Russian army invaded, and by September 1831, the Polish army was defeated. Now, afterwards, Tsar suspended the Polish constitution and just ruled by decree. All of the Polish army was disbanded, and as a result of this, many Poles, by the way, emigrated to France or North America, which is why your original population might have a lot of lot of Poles in them. But the Poles rebelled again in 1863. This time, the rebellion lasted for 18 months, but it was eventually crushed. Afterwards, the Kingdom of Poland was dissolved completely, and the area was renamed the Vistula Provinces. Russian was, again, uh, as in the, in the Estonian and Latvian provinces, made the official language of the government, and the Poles were forced to, forced to use it in schools, which was a part of a policy to suppress Polish culture. On the other hand, at this point, Tsar abolished serfdom in these territories. At the same time, in the western parts of the Polish uh, Polish territories, which were now ruled by the Prussians, they also tried to suppress Polish culture as much as they could. But this didn't succeed very much. See, uh, in the late 19th century, and again we're speaking about a similar revival as in, in the previous part of, of La- about Latvia, when we talked about Latvians and Estonians, 
yeah, a nationalistic revival can be seen, and the Poles in the late 19th century formed various political movements, including the Nationalistic League, the Christian Democrats, and, and this is important, the Polish Socialist Party. But now, now we kind of have to return back to Lithuania a bit. And now back to Lithuania a bit. You see, in the early 19th century, there was a short period in Poland known as the Samogitian Revival, which was led by students of Vilnius Uni- University, Simonas Daukantas and Simonas Stankevičius, and others, of course, and this was kind of similar to what happened later in the Tartu University with, uh, with, with Latvian and Estonian students. This, however... In all of these, in all of these revolts and everything, uh, this led to the closing of Vilnius University in 1832. By the year 1865, printed Lithuanian language as such was completely banned there. A policy of <clears throat> quote restoration of the Russian beginnings was initiated, as Russian propaganda claimed that before Polonization, the Lithuanian lands were in fact Russian. The Roman Catholic Church was also persecuted, with some church buildings torn down and some others handed over to the Russian Orthodox Church. New Russian Orthodox Churches, by the way, sprung up in new towns or or the largest cities. The Uniates, who were regarded as schismatic Orthodoxes, were disbanded altogether. Mikhail Muravyov, nicknamed the Hangman, was made the Governor-General, of ethnically Lithuanian governorates. Those are the gubernias, the governorships, and other sources name them differently. But at the same time, as the late 19th century Polish revival happened, uh, Polish revival happened, the same things happened in Lithuania as well. See, the persecutions, which happened there, as in all western provinces of the Russian Empire, they failed to defeat Lithuanians. And an interesting phenomenon happened called Knigneshiai, literally book carriers, uh, were smuggling banned Lithuanian books from the Lithuania Minor, which is, by the way, now in the UNESCO cultural heritage, uh, cultural her- her- heritage thing. And they smuggled all this, all this out, and this was a huge movement where these book smugglers were actively operating all around the place and trying to preserve... Uh, Lithuanian books and Lithuanian language everywhere, and these il- and they even helped to set up some illegal Lithuanian language schools in, in villages. Uh, a Catholic priest, namely <clears throat> a Catholic priest by the name of Motieus Valantius, at the same time started and led the Absistence movement, uh, we- and this was important at the period because uh, the Russians had introduced extremely cheap uh, alcohol namely, you know, vodka, in the region as a concentrated policy of weakening the, the all this revival process going on around in the Baltics uh, through making them addicted to alcohol in large quantities. Because, you see, previously in all this region we were mostly in the beer zone. We drank beer a lot, so uh, during this late 19th century period... This is where vodka enters the the picture, and this is this was a controlled attempt on on making sure that everyone got drunk constantly. But yeah, it was during this this period where where these book carriers went around and the subsistence movement was here. It was it was during this period when the popular idea of liberation among ethnic Lithuanians switched from restoration of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania to an establishment of a smaller independent state of the Lithuanian ethnic lands, leaving the rest of former Grand Duchy to the Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Polish ethnic states. Uh, These events, which were together named Lithuanian National Revival, tamed the long-term assimilation-induced decline of the Lithuanian inhabited area and, you know, their share of, of, of all this situation. Back then, you see, economically, Russia was backwards compared to the Western Europe. And while there was some infrastructure development, such as the St. Petersburg to Warsaw Railroad of 1861 that went through Vilnius, this was far from the Western standards. Moreover, the official class division of the society was rigorously supported by the state, and only in, in the year 1861 the farmers ceased to be regarded as the property of the local nobles. 
And uh, this is important to Lithuania. Unlike Latvia, where our capital Riga was among the largest cities of the Russian Empire and very economically important and a trading hub, Lithuania was expected by the Russian authorities to remain an agricultural, agricultural hinterland. The industrialization and urbanization that defined 19th century elsewhere in Europe therefore remained limited, but the towns and cities were still growing much faster than ever before in history in Lithuania. Lithuanians seeking industrial jobs had to migrate elsewhere, some to the major cities of the Russian Empire such as Riga or St. Petersburg, but a lot of others to the United States, together with the Poles who went, uh, went abroad uh, after the revolt of 1863. And, weirdly enough, in 1900, there were more Lithuanian speakers in Riga and in Chicago than in any city in Lithuania, where the few cities that existed were dominated by Polish speakers and Jews. In Lithuania Minor, the cities were lar largely German, you know, from, from the same, uh, same era as previously, while some Lithuanian towns and villages gradually Germanized over the century. In spite of this, Lithuania Minor, technologically advanced, and devoid of discriminatory Russian policies, kind of remained the central fortress of all the Lithuanian National Revival movement. And when the Russian Empire started to crumble in 1904, when it lost the war to Japan, and had to give in to some demands of its minorities, Lithuanian language was again permitted, and the Lithuanian countryside sprung up with new Roman Catholic Church spires, because Poland and Lithuania are like the bastions of Catholicism in Eastern Europe. During the war, in 1915, the Germans captured Lithuania proper, and then Brest-Litovsk Treaty happened, about which we spoke about in the previous episode. And, you know, through all of this mess, in quite the similar, quite similar circumstances <laughs> that, that in Estonia and uh, Latvia, uh, this led to a possibility uh, to declare independence in February 16, 1918. As in the rest of the cases of the, in the Baltics, this newly independent Lithuania, independence proclaimed by the Council of Lithuania, which, by the way, they had attempted before, uh, kind of forming an alliance with the Germans, but Germans backstabbed Lithuanians, so they declared it again, and th this is why this 16th of February is now celebrated as the Independence Day in Lithuania. This, this country faced again foreign enemies uh, in, in these years between 1918 and 1921. First off, there were the Bolsheviks, of whom many were Latvian Red Riflemen, who were forced to fight outside of Latvia, and in this, in these battles that we discussed in the last episode, but there'll be a recap of those, so don't worry. They also faced the pro-Tsar Bermontian army of former World War I POWs led by Bermontavalov, which was crushed in the 1919 near Riga. And later on, they also faced and fought against the Republic of Poland, who was also born at the final stages of the World War I. You see, Poland as a country, re-emerged in November 1918, after more than a century of partitions by Austria-Hungary, the German and the Russian empires. Unlike the rest of the Baltic states, like Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, who basically declared themselves to exist and then had to fight for it, Poland's independence was confirmed by the victorious powers through the Treaty of Versailles of June 1919. And of course, they faced a lot of wars and everything, but this this uh, this existence of Poland was kind of confirmed there and, and put in place because at this point the Allies thought of Poland as you know a potential ally and a potential kind of a potential tool to be used against the Bolsheviks. The Polish political scene inside was democratic, but it was extremely chaotic, and we can just talk about Józef Pilsudski basically running the scene and, and trying to swat down all opposition. Uh, Józef Pilsudski, by the way, will uh, later on seize power in May 1926 and become the author authoritarian leader, which, by the way, happened in all of, uh, all of these countries. We became authoritarian at one point or another, but that's on the interwar period of history. Oh boy, to which I shall also devote a whole episode, because that's going to be a bit easier. Now, Unlike industrialization that happened elsewhere, this this new uh, Republic of Poland 
had basically adopted this policy of agrarianism, and they they made a massive economical reforms and re- redistributed lands to peasants, and you know this achieved the significant economic growth in the interwar period. What's the most important part is that the Poles literally fought everyone else after after they established their republic, and uh, and this led to one third of the population consisting of minorities. Ukrainians, Jews, Belarusians, and Germans, who were, by the way, either hostile towards the existence of the Polish state because of the lack of privileges, or often discriminated against. In the case of Ukrainians and Belarusians, who faced Polonization, same as before everyone had faced Russification. There were sort of treaties that supposedly protected these minorities, but the government in Warsaw really wasn't interested in their enforcement. And one of the reasons why is a certain idea of Józef Pilsudski of an intermarium federation. Miedzimorze. Miedzimorze, maybe, I'm, I'm not very fluent in Polish. Which he saw as a counterweight to Russian and German imperialism. This was an idea of, at the beginning, kind of restoring the old, old Poland-Lithuania, old Commonwealth. But then, uh, Pilsudski pressed forward this idea of intermarium, which would uh, be kind of a Polish-run huge federation, which, as he hoped, would encompass all the Baltic states, uh, like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, uh, Ukraine, parts of Ukraine at least, and uh, also would include Scandinavian countries in in this, which would then provide to be an alliance and a counterforce to Russia. Of course, he was majorly resisted by both the Soviets and internally who saw this as utopia, and by the Western countries who at this point of history, by the way, are looking at what's going on in the, in the Soviet Union and all the, all of these territories in Eastern Europe, and they are just thinking that, oh well, Bolshevism would be probably extremely temporary, so, you know, we shouldn't help anyone who's trying to weaken Russia, which has been our trustful ally for a long period of time. But this wasn't, this wasn't the only reason why the idea of intermarium kind of failed. Because like I said, this idea and, and this chaotic democratic scene where Josef Pilsudski, even though, like I said before, he managed to stop the Soviet advance and fought against Trotskyist forces and really stopped the Trotskyist idea of world revolution, he won, he was basically at war with everyone else at one point or another because, yeah, his own ideas of this Intermarium Federation. And by the way, this idea is kind of still alive today, because uh, recently on Twitter I found that there are there are organizations who would like to see this Intermarium Alliance being alive today. They are mostly kind of uh, right-wing nationalistic organizations of Eastern Europe who would, cement, who would like to cement a closer relationship uh, between all of our countries, well, unlike this time, it wouldn't be run by the Poles, it would be kind of more democratic, but there are there are certain movements the, to this day, so Pilsudski's idea is is not completely dead yet, it's, it's facing somewhat of a resurgence, at least on the internet, I might say. But back then, yeah, back then the Poles got just put in there by the Treaty of Versailles, together with, you know, them, them rebelling and, and using all these previously mentioned chaotic events to just, you know, become Poland again. And then Pilsudski tries to establish this intermarium. See, Lithuania withstood the foreign interventions back then, and we're back to Lithuania now. You know, they, they beat uh, they beat the Bolsheviks, they, they beat the remnants of Bermontovalov. But yeah, the Polish attack, in breach of the Suvalkai Treaty, by the way, led to an annexation of the eastern Lithuania, including the capital city of Vilnius, to Poland. This was never recognized, and Lithuania remained at a state of war with Poland, with the new government city, Kaunas, officially designated the temporary capital. And, we won't, ca- we won't come down without Vilnius, became a popular slogan, and organizations like the <clears throat> Union for the Liberation of Vilnius sprung up with the Lithuanian-Polish territorial dispute which, by the way, became one of the keystones of interwar Lithuania's policy. And yeah, they Lithuania got their Vilnius back and the whole eastern territory 
only after the Soviet occupation there. And this is a very interesting, interesting story. See, at this point, uh, like I mentioned in the previous episode, about 80% of people living in Vilnius were Polish. And even during the Soviet era, a, a lot of Polish people were in Vilnius. It, it's an interesting situation there, but it's, but, but, but this is mostly because, like I mentioned in the beginning, the Lithuanian lands, the cities in Lithuanian lands were either Germanized or Polonized or Rus- or, or just Russified in a way. Uh, Lithuanians were kept in this agrarian state, and even though some, some towns grew up, uh, unlike Latvia and Estonia, where there were major Latvian and Estonian culture centers in the cities, in Lithuania this was kind of squashed down. The cities were never Lithuanian to begin with, even though the countryside and territories surrounding it would be. And this is sort of an interesting counterpoint, uh, and counterpoint in history when you think about it, because, yeah, the rest of the countryside was Lithuanian. It was just that Vilnius, like I said, was Polonized during the during the Commonwealth there. So, you know, this is why we can speak about the tragedy of Lithuanian people. So, here's a recap of all these of all these wars going on here. Just just so you know. <clears throat> As November 1918 ceasefire stopped all fighting on the Western Front, battles continued in the East, which has been really obstructed by everything else going on at the time. But it was like always been obscured by these bipolar wars, such as the Polish Soviet War, which we spoke about, Russian Civil War, which we'll have to get into in the next episode, the Freikorps War, and Estonian Latvian Lithuanian Wars of Independence. It's all just a huge mess. By the way, the foreign influence in the wars, both from the German and Allied sides, significantly influenced the conflicts with the Entente pressing the German military command to defend the region against Bolshevik troops, and with British troops and warships supporting the war effort of uh, Generals Nikolai Yudenich's White Army in the Baltics. At the end, however, as in everywhere else, as in other, other peripheries of the former Russian army, it turned out that Entente had only very limited influence on the emergence of post-war order in the Baltics. Thus, making the military appropriation of territory significantly more important than in the peripheries of the German Empire and the former Austrian Empire, where all the post-war order was based on peace negotiations in Paris and the conduct of, of, you know, various referendums. Over here we had to fight for it. And even though all the Baltic states had already declared independence during the war, as we did, it had been severely limited by the German military authorities who prevented the formation of national armies. After the November armistice, however, the disintegration of the German troops, increasingly demoralized and the advance of the Red Army, made the establishment of the armed troops to defend the territories claimed by the Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian states a necessity. And now we have to go back to the previous episode and talk about the Estonian People's Army, or (coughs) Eesti Rachvavagi, as I hope I pronounced it correctly. Estonian army was drawing on small national units formed after the February Revolution. It grew in a very short time to about 74,000 uh, 74, soldiers. Thus, they managed to push back the Red Army out of its claimed territory as early as February 1919. It subsequently overcra- overcame its strong dependence on the <clears throat> Balten Regiment, Bal- the Baltic Regiment, which was formed by the Baltic German Associations, but remained subordinate to the Estonian Supreme Commander and numbered just between 700 and 800 soldiers at the beginning. So they overcame it very easily. In Latvia, this was significantly more difficult since the strongest Latvian national units, the Riflemen, numbering about 24,000 soldiers in autumn 1918, remained loyal to the Bolsheviks. Yeah, uh, the same Bolsheviks who would then go on and try to subdue Lithuania and uh, institute Soviet regime here in in Latvia because of of Mr. Pelsha, who managed to be in the inner circle of Lenin. Latvian National Army... Latvia's Brunjotes back, was only founded in July 1919 with substantial help from the Estonians, the Germans, and the Entente. The German military authorities initially delayed the draft and armament of the Lithuanian army, Lietuvos Kariomene, which was initially recru- recruited mainly from prisoners of war who were returning from Germany to Vilnius. After the German retreat, the Lithuanian army grew considerably, 
and comprised about 10,000 soldiers in May 1919. The Estonian army managed to the Estonian army managed to push the Red Army out of its territory again very early. In Latvia, this was quite a bit more difficult. With the Red Army occupying Riga on 3rd January 1919 and almost the entire territory claimed by independent Latvia over the next few weeks, except for a stretch along the coast at Liepāja. And this Liepāja uh, incident is interesting because there are kind of the government which declared Latvian independence with Karlis Ulmanis at its forefront had to escape uh, via a British kind of military ship which they had acquired from the Russians and it was named Saratov which was extremely interesting the British supported the ship with their own guns so all the government uh, of independent Latvia kind of the patriotic Latvia escaped via the ship at the same time, in Lithuania, the situation wasn't much better. The Red Army had managed to occupy the northeast of claimed territory as well, as well as Vilnius, uh, which they did in the 3rd January of 1919. Vilnius passed several times between Bolshevik and Polish occupiers over the course of the Polish-Soviet War, and remained completely out of reach of the Lithuanian authorities, which, by the way, at the same time claimed it as the capital of the state. But starting in spring 1919, the Bolsheviks were gradually pushed out of northern Lithuania with the help of, of Estonians, Latvians, and Poles and everyone else. Because all of this was just going in a crazy mishmash, which is why I like finding new sources which just complement what I've said in the previous episodes. Unlike in Estonia, the Baltic German military units formed in Latvia, uh, Baltic Shalandeswer, quickly came into conflict with the national Latvian government, toppled it, and started pushing back the Bolsheviks, taking Riga on the 22nd of May 1919. This led to a joint Estonian-Latvian effort against the Landeswehr at the Battle of Tsesis, which resulted in the deci decisive defeat of the Baltische Landeswehr on the 23rd of June 1919. However, other Freikorps started pouring into the Baltics, following reactionary agendas or simply seeking land. After the Entente order to evacuate the German army from the Baltics, these Freikorps mostly gathered in the West Russian Voluntary Army under the lead of White General Pavel, Pavel Bermontovalov and, in effect, of Rudger von der Goltz. Although officially fighting the Bolsheviks, the West Russian Volunteer Army entered into open conflict with the emerging Baltic states and gained control over large parts of Latvian and Lithuanian territory over the course of late summer and early autumn 1919. Defeats against the Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian armies, and this defeat of these Freikorps armies which wanted to establish their own government was this Bermontiada, which we spoke about in the last episode. All of this uh, ultimately, ultimately led to the evacuation of most of Bermontovalov's troops. After the advance on St. Petersburg failed on October 1919, the anti-Bolshevik Northwestern Army, commanded by Nikolai Yudenich, was disarmed by the troops of uh, Stanislav Bulak Balachovic, who, by the way, subsequently uh, continued fighting the Bolsheviks in the Polish army. At the same time, the Polish army became increasingly involved in the wars of independence in the Baltics, occupying Vilnius repeatedly and advancing far north into Latgale, which is a Latvian province, in October 1919. Poland also launched an offensive in summer 1919 against Lithuania, while at the same time unsuccessfully trying to stage a coup against the Lithuanian government. So, you see, we had to fight against the Poles and the Bolsheviks and each other and the Germans and everyone else here. Complete craziness. The wars ended officially with a series of peace treaties negotiated with the Soviet Russia, which defined the eastern borders of the new states. Estonia's on the 2nd of February in Tartu Treaty, Lithuania's on 12th of July 1920 in Moscow Treaty, and Latvia's on 11th of August 1920 in Riga Treaty. Lithuania concluded a border treaty with Poland on the 7th of, of October 1920, which was known as the Suwalki Agreement. Which, mind you, was completely violated by the Polish occupation of Vilnius only two days later. So now, now we're into the fun part of this episode, uh, about how the Polish just violated treaties in the name of this Intermarum. Hi, this is Alice. 
First off, we would like to thank everyone for their Patreon donations, and we sincerely hope that you enjoy the audiobook that we're providing for you, and next chapter is imminent, by the way. If you think that some other for Patreons extras should be made, please write to us, either on our email or Facebook or Twitter. If you want to become a patron, visit patreon.com slash the eastern border, or just click the sign up button on our Facebook page. Also, we appreciate any PayPal donations that you can give us via the donate button on our homepage, and any of our t-shirts or mug that you buy also via a link in our homepage. If you want to support the show, it really means a lot to us. You, the nice people who support us, are literally our employers, and we try our very best to make you happy. Besides that, we're starting to collect questions for another Q&A episode, so if you have any, please, feel free to send them in. And now, back to the show. You see, during all of this massive chaos of things which we have now described in, oh boy, three episodes by now, and I hope you, you have some understanding of the general events going on here, uh, during all of this, you see, weird things started to happen here. On October the 8th, 1920, just one day after the Pol- this Suwalki agreement, a Polish general, Lucian Zeligowski, staged a mutiny among Polish troops and marched on Vilnius to mm, defend the right of self-determination of local Poles. Because, again, there was a huge Polish majority in Vilnius. See, this was all orchestrated by the Polish chief of state, Józef Pilsudski, our nice friend who is often celebrated as the savior from the Soviets, which he did, but uh, he was also a bit of a megalomaniac at, at some points. And you see, he had ordered his subordinate, this same Lucian Zeligowski, to stage this mutiny. And Zeligowski, at this time, was running his 1st Lithuanian-Belarusian Division, which, which consisted of about 16 battalions with 14,000 soldiers in them, and he had he had been ordered to construct a mutiny and capture Vilnius as sort of, you know, it just happened, it's captured, it's ours now, without, you know, any direct involvement. As, like mentioned before, <laughs> they just had signed the Svalky Agreement. This rebellion had basically two main goals. Capture Vilnius and preserve Polish international reputation. See, the League of Nations at this point, which gave birth to modern Poland, or modern Poland in the sense that it was this Second Republic, it was mediating other Polish disputes, notably over the free city of Danzig and Upper Silesia. And direct aggression against Lithuania would have kind of hampered Polish bargaining positions. So, while the Polish side officially held Zeligowski to be a deserter, and did not support him, Poland provided logistic support, including munitions and food rations, to his units. Zeligowski also received reinforcements when, according to the official version, the mutiny spread further among the Polish forces. His initial attack was secured on both sides by two other other Polish armies, again by the orders of Pilsudski. This whole mutiny uh, was in planning since mid-September, and it began in the early morning of October 8, 1920, just a few hours after the signing of the Suwalki Agreement. A provisional agreement was made in the Polish-Soviet War, which freed up Polish units for the attack on Lithuania. And this agreement was about the splits of Ukraine and what would happen with that country, which didn't happen to exist for a, for a period of time back then. As part of this whole ruse thing going on, Zeligowski wrote a note to Polish command announcing his mutiny and expressing his disappointment with the Suwalki Agreement. He claimed that his troops marched to defend the right of self-determination of local Polish population. Zeligowski's forces captured Vilnius, but further advances were stopped by Lithuanian troops, who were just taken by complete surprise. I mean, they literally signed the agreement hours before this happened. So Zeligowski takes Vilnius and uh, a strip of land in eastern eastern Lithuania, and proclaims the creation of <clears throat> Republic of Central Lithuania, with capital in Vilnius. They attempted to continue the assault, you know, trying to capture Konyas and take over the rest of Lithuania, again, all for Pilsudski's intermarum idea, but they were stopped by Lithuanian forces, who, even though they could stop the advance, really, after all this mess going on, 
and with every every war just it was a war torn country and they unlike Poland didn't receive Entente support they weren't able to capture back Vilnius and you know its surroundings so because of this on November 29th a ceasefire was signed the prolonged meditation by the League of Nations did not change the situation and the League of Nations officially admitted that you know that it's a status quo in 1923 by this point, when they accepted the status quo, the Republic of Sir, Sir, uh, Sir, <clears throat> this Republic of Central Lithuania had already been incorporated into Poland as <clears throat> Vilnius Voivodeship, which had happened a year earlier in 1922. See, Lithuania obviously did not recognize these developments and continued to claim Vilnius as its constitutional capital. There were literally no diplomatic relations between Poland and Lithuania until the Polish ultimatum of 1938, which we'll get to in future. And this ultimatum, in short right now, was basically an attempt of Poland to secure their northern borders, because, you know, of all the tensions that had been brewing and that as World War II was sort of closing in on them. And by the only diplomatic relations, we mean some really crazy stuff. You see, this dispute over Vilnius remained one of the biggest foreign policy issues in Lithuania and Poland. They refused any actions that would recognize Poland's control of Vilnius even de facto. For example, Lithuania broke off diplomatic relations with the Holy See, the Vatican, like the Pope, which is a huge blow if you think about it, because, again, Poland and Lithuania are the main bastions of of Catholicism in the region, and Catholicism was also kind of the main source of them resisting the Soviets in the Soviet era, so this is this is huge culturally, but they had to do it, so they just cut off diplomatic relations with the Vatican and the Pope and the Holy See after the Concordat of 1925 had established an ecclesi- ecclesiastical province in Vilnius, thereby acknowledging Poland's claims to the city. And they just couldn't stand it. At the same time, Poland refused to formally recognize the existence of any dispute regarding the region, since that would have kind of lent legitimacy to Lithuanian claims. This whole thing led to railroad traffic and telegraph lines not being able to cross the border, and mail service was very complicated. You see, a letter from Poland to Lithuania needed to be sent to a neutral country, repackaged in a new envelope to remove any Polish signs, and only then it would be delivered to Lithuania. Stating that the situation was tense was uh, kind of an understatement here. But yeah, all these disputes kind of ended only with the Soviet occupation, which uh, only only with the Soviet occupation in 1939. Okay, and now as we are in the complete mess of everything, I want to go back... I want to go back a bit to uh, certain events in 1918. Oh boy, because I really want to get that year out of everything, as we have spoken about what happened literally on the western parts of, of everything now, and go back to Russia just a bit, because... Lithuania and Poland and Latvia and Estonia left us all in a complete mess, and now we know how they got their independence. Kind of. And we need to go back to Russia at this point. And do you remember the nice timeline that we had? Yeah. We're still on this part. As far as I would remember, as far as I remember of all the situation, we ended up with, with, when in June, the Czech Legion, along with Essers and other white forces, put an end to Bolshevik control in many, many rural areas. You see, let's go back to June 1918 in Russia and see how the Soviet forces waged through all of these massive wars fought in Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and everyone else. Because some very important things are happening there in 1918 whilst the fighting is going on elsewhere. For starters... <clears throat> for for starters, in the June of 28th of 1918, Veshenka, <clears throat> the Soviet Economic Committee, announces its policy of uh, war communism, which is an important thing that I would like to get into in detail. You see, war communism was the system 
the name given to the economic system that existed in Russia from 1918 to 1921, which is basically during all these wars, which was how they funded their military, military advances everywhere and their constant being at war situation. It was introduced by Lenin to combat the economic problems brought on by the civil war. It was a com- it was a combination of emergency measures and socialist dogma. See, one of the first measures of war communism was the nationalization of land. Banks and shipping was all- were also nationalized, and foreign trade was declared a state monopoly. This was the response when Lenin realized that the Bolsheviks were simply unprepared to take over the whole economic system of Russia. Lenin stressed the importance of the workers showing discipline and a will to work hard if the revolution was to survive. There were those in the Bolshevik hierarchy who wanted factory managers removed and the workers to take over the factories for themselves, but on the behalf of the people. It was felt that the workers would work better if they believed that they were working for a cause, as opposed to a system that made some rich, but many poor. The Civil War had made many in the Bolshevik party even more class antagonistic, as there were many of the old guard who were fighting to destroy the Bolsheviks by now, and, you know, by many, by many we have to literally say everyone else. So on June 28th, 1918, a decree was passed that ended all forms of private capitalism. Many large factories were taken over by the state, and on on November 29th, 1920, any factory or industry that employed over 10 workers was nationalized. War communism also took control of the distribution of food. The food commissariat was set up to carry out this task. All cooperatives were fused together under this commissariat. But the war communism itself had six principles. Number one, production should be run by the state. Private ownership should be kept to the minimum. Private houses were to be confiscated by the state. Number two, state control was to be granted over the labor of every citizen. Once a military army had served its purpose, it would become a labor army. Number three, the state should produce everything in its own undertakings. The state thus tried to control the activities of millions of peasants. Number four, extreme centralization was introduced. The economic life in the area controlled by the Bolsheviks was put into the hands of just a few organizations. The most important one was the Supreme Economic Council, which we mentioned before, this Veshanka. This had the right to confiscate and requisition. The specialty of the SEC was the management of industry. Over 40 head departments, known as Glavki, literally the heads or headers, were set up to accomplish this. One Glavka could be responsible for thousands of factories. This frequently resulted in chronic inefficiency. The Commissariat of Transport controlled the railways, and the Commissariat of Agriculture controlled whatever else the peasants did. Number five. The state attempted to become the sole distributor as well as the sole producer. The Commissariats took what they needed to meet demands. The people were divided into four categories. Manual workers in harmful trades, workers who performed hard physical labor, workers in light tasks, housewives and professional people. Food was distributed to them on a 4-3-2-1 ratio. Though the manual class was the favored class, it still received very little food, which then uh, caused riots to appear even more. Many in the professional class simply starved. It is believed that about, you know, that about 60% of all food consumed came from illegal sources of the professional class, mind you. On July the 20th, 1918, the Bolsheviks decided that all surplus food had to be surrendered to the state. This led to an increase in the supply of grain to the state, obviously. From 1917 to 1918, about, uh, about uh, three quarters of a million tons was collected by the state. In 1920... Uh, to 1921, this had risen to about 6 million tons. However, the policy of having to hand, uh, hand over surplus food caused huge resentment in the countryside, especially as Lenin, as you might remember, had promised all land to the people pre-November 1917. While peasants had the land, they had not been made aware that they would have to hand over any extra food they produced from their land. But even the extra could not meet demand. Uh, later on, in 1933, 25 millions of tons, million tons of grain was collected, and this only just barely met the complete demand of the country. And number six, war communism attempted to abolish money as a means of exchange. The Bolsheviks wanted to go over to a system of a natural economy in which all transactions were carried out in kind. Effectively, bartering would be introduced. 
By 1921, when the war communism system ended, the value of the ruble had dropped massively and inflation had markedly increased. The government's revenue-raising ability was chronically poor, as it had abolished most taxes. The only tax allowed was the extraordinary revolutionary tax, which was targeted at the rich and not the workers. And this war communism was basically one of the reasons why the Bolsheviks, even though they managed at the end to win the civil war at home, why they couldn't beat the Poles, the Lithuanians, Latvians, everyone else, basically, and why all this independence managed to even happen. Because it was a disaster. In all areas, the economic strength of Russia fell below 1914 level. Peasant farmers only grew food for themselves, as they knew that any extra would be taken by the state. Therefore, the industrial cities were starved of food despite this introduction of this 4-3-2-1 ratio. A bad harvest could be disastrous for the countryside, but it was even worse for the cities. Malnutrition was common, as was disease. Those in the cities believed that their only hope was moved out to the countryside and grow food for themselves. So, between 1916 and 1920, during the Civil War, the cities of northern and central Russia lost about 33% of the po their population to the countryside. Under war communism, the number of those working in the factories and mines dropped by 50%. In the cities, private trade was illegal, but more people were engaged in this than at any other time in Russia's history. Large factories just became paralyzed through lack of fuel and skilled labor. Small factories were in 1920 producing just 33% of their 1913 total. Large factories were producing 18% of their 1913 figure. Coal production was at 27% of its 1913 figure in 1920. With little food to nourish them, it could not be expected that the workers could work eff effectively. By the 1920, the average worker had a productivity rate that was 44% less than the 1913 figure. So you see, it was just crazy. Not only they had to face revolts everywhere and, you know, our independence struggles in this chaotic war, one of the reasons why we actually succeeded in them was the fact that Soviet party introduced this war communism, thus just crushing basically every chance of, of economical potential that the Soviets even held. And that the fact that they, despite all of this, managed to come out victorious in the Civil War by basically just signing a massive line of treaties with everyone who wanted independence, except in their own central territories. Uh, yeah, that was a miracle in itself. And, and basically, even if anything of value could be produced, the ability to move it around Russia was very limited. By the end of 1918... When this, when these wars are still going on en masse, Russia's rail system was in complete chaos. In the countryside, most of the land was used for the growth of food. Core crops such as flax and cotton simply were not grown. Between 1913 and 1920, again during these revolutions and war, there was an, a staggering 87% drop in the number of acres given over to cotton production. Therefore, those produ factories producing cotton-related products, such as uniforms for the army, were starved of the most, com most basic commodities they needed. So, how did the people react to war communism? Within the cities, many were convinced that their leaders were right and that the failings being experienced were the fault of the whites and international capitalists. There were few strikes during war communism, though Lenin was quick to have anyone arrested who seemed to be a potential cause of trouble. <clears throat> By the beginning of this period, like when this full rush on happened, uh, Cheka had already been numbered about 10,000 personal strong, uh, yeah, Cheka was about 10,000 strong at this point, and in July they will respond to the Moscow uprising of the L of the left SRs by just purging and executing all of them. So Cheka is strong, suppressions are strong, and even though the country is just starving and fighting in the civil war, this is what essentially led the Soviets collapsing everywhere else but inside Russia. See, those in Bolshevik-held territory were also keen to see a Bolshevik victory in the Civil War, so they were prepared to do what was necessary. The white victory for them was also unthinkable. Also, the Bolshevik hierarchy could br blame a lot of Russia's troubles on the whites, as they controlled the areas which would have supplied the factories with produce. The, the Urals provided Petrograd and Tula with coal and iron for their factories, but they were completely separated from Bolshevik, Bolshevik Russia from the spring of 1918 to November 1919. Why? Because of the Czechoslovak Legion. Oil fields were also in the hands of the whites.
and the and also the Bolsheviks Red Army took up the complete majority of whatever supplies there were in <clears throat> there were in their fight against the whites. At the same time, no foreign country was prepared to trade with the Russia controlled by the Bolsheviks, so foreign trade ceased to exist. Between 1919 and November 1920, the Allies formally blockaded Russia. So, the harshness of war communism kind of could be justified, maybe, whilst the civil war is going on. When it had, when it, what had finished, finally, with the victory of the Reds, and loss of all their, all their, like all these countries that I've mentioned previously, there, there was just no such justification. And then, then, a violent rebellions started out. And now I'm just jumping in the future a bit, but yeah, there were violent rebellions in uh, Tambov and in Siberia. The most important rebellion, after, you know, war had ended and the treaties were signed, was the so-called Kronstadt Rebellion. It was one of the several major internal uprisings against the Soviet rule uh, after after civil war, and it was conducted by sailors from the Kronstadt naval, naval base. It greatly influenced the Communist Party's decision to actually undertake a program of economic liberalization to relieve the hardships suffered by the population during the Civil War and kind of to amend this war communism a bit. You see, the sailors located the Kronstadt Fortress in the Gulf of Finland, which was right next to Petrograd, which is now St. Petersburg, they had supported Bolsheviks in 1917. Their, uh, oper- their cooperation also had been very crucial to success of the October Revolution. During the Civil War, however, they had become completely disenchanted with the Bolshevik government, which had been, like I said before, completely unable to provide an adequate food supply to urban populations, and had restricted political freedoms of everyone and imposed very strict labor regulations. So when the urban workers responded in the early 1921 with strikes and demonstrations, the Kronstadt sailors, sympathizing with them, them formed the Provisional Revolutionary Committee. In addition to economical reform, they demanded Soviets without Bolsheviks. The release of non-Bolshevik socialists from prison, the end of Communist Party's dictatorship, and the establishment of political freedoms and civil rights. Obviously, Leon Trotsky and Mikhail N. Tukhachevsky led a force that crushed the rebels, shooting or imprisoning the survivors. Glorious Cheka! Oh boy. Nevertheless, nevertheless, by dramatically demonstrating popular dis- dissatisfaction with the communist policies, the rebellion had forced the party to adopt the new economic policy in March 1921, which brought some relief after this war communism to the Soviets, uh, which again will lead on to Soviet developments in the future. But this ec- new economical policy will be there only until 1928, but as it starts in 1921, we can now just skip over it and touch it in a future episode. So yeah. War communism, the biggest reason why I think the Soviets actually lost all these territories and why independent Baltic states and independent Finland and independent Poland actually could exist at this period. Because if the Soviets had managed to run even a somewhat competent government, uh, then they could be able to deal with their internal revolts way earlier and with way more efficiency. And then I presume the Soviet Union... uh, even at its beginning, could be able to hold on on its Russian territories. So, on its non-Russian territories. So I guess I I have to be kind of happy about this thing. And 1918 is not only only important because of this introduction of war communism, which will then eventually lead to Soviets losing, but also for two other things. First off, in July... As, by the way, United, United States President Woodrow Wilson approves a 5,000 strong American force to support the White Army in Northern Russia, but it never leads, never leads to anything and they are evacuated quite, quite shortly after. Uh, in the same month, the Romanov family and their local entourage are shot by a local Cheka detachment while under house arrest in Yekaterinburg. So yes, now we come to the very tragic story of the Romanov family. Um, I would like to make a joke about finally Nikki getting out of the way, but... Oh boy, it's a bit sadder than that. So you see, as as Bolsheviks are in this massive civil war against the whites uh, and like everyone else around him and... And everything... See, 
Lenin responded to this with this war communism, and this is where his terror side starts to show up. So at the beginning, uh, Lenin had decided to move the, camel, uh, the family, which had been imprisoned from Tob which had been imprisoned from Toboysk, a bit closer to Moscow, where he had relocated the Russian capital. A trusted Bolshevik, wa Bo Bolshevik factotum was dispatched to bring the Romanovs westward, and in April 1918, they entered a trip by train and carriage. During this trip. Uh, the teenage Alexei, one of the Romanov sons, suffered an attack of, of bleeding and had to be left behind. He came to Yekaterinburg three weeks later with three of his sisters. The girls, meanwhile, were sexually molest molested on the train, but eventually the family was reunited in the, a gloomy walled mansion of a merchant named Ipatyev in the center of the city, whose leaders were among the most fanatical of Bolsheviks. This mansion there was ominously renamed the <clears throat> House of Special Purpose and converted into a prison fortress with painted over windows, fortified walls and machine gun nests. The Romanovs, <clears throat> the Romanovs received limited rations and were watched by hostile guards. But the family kind of adapted. Our good old pal Nicky uh, is reported to be reading books aloud in the evening and he tried to do some exercise. The oldest daughter Olga became depressed here, but... You know, the playful and spirited younger girls, especially Maria and Anastasia, began to interact with the guards. Maria even began an illicit romance with one of them, and the guards sort of discussed helping the girls escape. When this was uncovered by Bolshevik boss Filip Goloshenkin, the guards were changed, regulations were tightened even more. And all of this, all of this made Lenin even more anxious. At the beginning of July 1918, it was clear that Yekaterinburg was going to fall to the whites. Glushenkin rushed to Moscow to get Lenin's approval, and it is certain that he got it, though Lenin was clever enough not to put the order on paper. The killing was planned under the new commandant of the House of Special Purpose, Yakov Yurovsky, who decided to recruit a squad to murder the royals altogether in one session, and then burn the bodies and bury them in the woods nearby. Just about every detail of the plan was very poorly conceived, as, you know, in the chaotic spirits of the time, and would be gratis when we just bungled up and, and fucked up in practice. So, early in this, early in the July 17th morning, the Romanovs and their loyal, loyal retainers were just standing in the, were just standing in, in the cellar of this building, as a heavily armed murder squad just rushed into the room. <clears throat> the 12 people. At this point, the, the white armies which supported the Tsar were approaching. The prisoners could already hear the boom of the big guns. They apparently had gathered in this cellar of the mansion. They were standing together almost as if they were posing for a family portrait. Alexandra asked for a chair, and Nicholas asked for another one for his only son, 13-year-old Alexei. The uh, two were brought down. They waited there, until suddenly, 11 or 12 heavily armed men filed ominously into this room. Yurovsky, one of them, suddenly just, you know, reads out the death sentence. Then the men just fired, fi fired the crowd gathered there. Each was meant to fire a different family member, but many of them secretly wished to avoid shooting the girls. So, basically, they all aimed at our good old friend Nikki and Alexandra, killing them almost instantly. The firing, according to the reports, was extremely wild. The killers managed to wound one another as the room filled with swirling dust and smoke and screams. When the first volley was done, most of the family was still alive, wounded, crying and terrified. Their suffering made worse by the fact that they were, in effect, wearing bulletproof vests. The Romanovs famed for their collection of jewelry, and they had left Petrograd with a large, large cache of diamonds hidden in their baggage. During the last months, they had sewn the diamonds into specifically made underwear in case they needed to fund an escape. On the night of the execution, the children had pulled on this secretly bejeweled underwear, which was reinforced with the hardest material existence. Tragically, ironically, the bullets bounced off of these garments, and, you know, just wounded them. Finally, the murderers waded into the gruesome scene of the wounded, bleeding children. Uh, one of the killers afterwards compared it to a slippery ice rink awash with blood and brains, and stabbed them maniacally with bayonets or shot them in the head. This mayhem lasted for about 20 agonizing minutes. When the bodies were being carried out, two of the girls turned out to be still alive, spluttering and coughing before being stabbed into silence. Uh, this was, by the way, the uh, origin of the legend that Anastasia, the youngest daughter, had survived. This, this is the story that had uh, <laughs> inspired a crazy amount of imposters there. 
to inspire to impersonate the murdered Grand Duchess. But yeah. Now that the deed was done, these drunken assassins and Bolshevik thugs started arguing about who was to move the bodies and where. They they mocked the deceased royals, basically, you know, peeing on them, pillaged their treasures, and then, you know, they just didn't care. Eventually, the bodies were just piled into a truck, which, by the way, soon broke down. Out in the woods where the Romanos were stripped naked and their clothing burned, it turned out that the mine shafts that had been selected to receive the bodies were too shallow. In a panic, Yurovsky improvised a new plan. He just left the bodies and rushed into Yekaterinburg for supplies. He spent, then, three days and three nights sleeplessly driving back and forth to the woods collecting sulfuric acid and gasoline to destroy the bodies, because, you know, he couldn't allow whites to get them, which he finally decided to bury in separate places to confuse anyone who might find them. He was determined to obey his orders that, quote, no one must ever know what had happened to the Romanov family. He pummeled the bodies with rifle butts, doused them with sulfuric acid, and burned them with gasoline. Finally, he buried what was left in them in two graves. Two graves which were completely unnamed. Now, how do we know all this? Ha. Huh. Well, you see, Yurovsky and his killers later wrote detailed, boastful, and extremely confused accounts for the Cheka. Again, good old buddies in the Cheka. The reports were then sequestered in the archives and never publicized. But, during the 1970s, the renewed interest in the murder site led Yuri Andropov, the chairman of the KGB, who then, as you know, became our good old general secretary, to just, you know, recommend that the House of Special Purpose be bulldozed so that we all would just forget about this, this nice, nice event. And, you know, all of this just, just came into forefront only in 2015, when, uh, when things were, when, when, when these remains were exhumed and DNA testing had been done. But yeah. One of the most, one of the most bloodiest stories of, of, of everything really here. But, but this, this, ladies and gentlemen, actually wasn't the most scariest thing that happened in 1918. One of the, in my opinion, craziest things the Soviets did was in August 19th, 1918, where Lenin issued his famous hanging order. <clears throat> Now, what is the hanging order, you ask? Well, good sirs, I have a nice translation here. <clears throat> Send to Penza, to comrades Kurayev, Bosch, Minikin, and other Penza communists. <clears throat> comrades, the revolt by five Kulak Volosts must be suppressed without mercy. The interest of the entire revolution demands this, because we have now before us our final decisive battle with the Kulaks. We need to set an example. Number one. You need to hang. Hang without fail so that the public sees at least 100 notorious kulaks, the rich and the bloodsuckers. Number two, publish their names. Number three, take away all of their grain. Number four, execute the hostages in accordance with yesterday's telegram. This needs to be accomplished in such a way that people for hundreds of miles around will see, tremble, know and scream out. Let's choke and strangle those blood bloodsucking kulaks. Telegraph us acknowledging receipt and execution of this. Yours, Lenin. P.S. Use your toughest people for this. So yeah, murdering of Romanovs, introducing war communism, hanging order, everything just starts to happen crazy, crazy fast and crazy murderous. But you know, not everything went nice and, and awesome. Because, for example, on August 30th, uh, head of Petrograd Cheka, St. Petersburg Cheka, Uritsky, was assassinated as an act of retaliation for these, for this violence and killings carried out by Bolsheviks. And at the same day, uh, there was another assassination attempt by a certain Fanya Kaplan, who was the member of the Socialist Revolutionaries, the Essers, which also left Lenin seriously wounded. So, you know, uh, by the by, the end of 1918, we had war communism. We had the beginnings of mass murders. There was still wars going on, and those pesky Baltics had declared independence. We are in a very very fun spot, comrades. Very fun spot, because all this story is going to get darker and darker in the future, even still. So in the next episode, I'll be talking about the end of the civil war inside of Russia and about what this new economical policy is, which will be set up in Soviet Russia in 1921. 
we are going to start to move into the interwar period of this era. But yeah, we have to end the revolution to begin speaking about the NEP. Because I presume that NEP is where you can truly spot the one one good period in Soviet Union that people have actually had. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this quite chaotic episode that was nonetheless very important in my opinion. Do svidaniya, tavarish. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.